Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Hallelujah. Amen. If you're not used to loud preachers, you might want to scoot back. I don't know. To tell you. Amen. Try to bring my microphone down if I get too loud. But um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to come and minister. Um, I can remember coming to this church when I was little, little uh, young. Uh, we grew up in Crescent Town and I went to Allegheny. Amen. Is there any Allegheny? I know we're on the wrong side of town, but there are probably not many Allegheny people out there. Hallelujah. If you went to Fort Hill, that's okay. We'll pray for you tonight. We'll get you, we'll get you fixed up. Amen. But, uh, so, but we thankful. I remember my, my dad, um, I, I guess generations, my grandfather was preaching. I got an uncle, my uncle Dave's over there and a lot of the, he's generation of preaching. My dad, that generation, amen. My generation, I got, we got generation coming up, amen, of preaching. So, Amen. So I, uh, you might think I'm just visiting, but I'm not visiting. I've been I've been hanging around here a long time. I just, Amen. I uh, we like 2000. I think two. We moved to West Virginia. And we pastor a church in Grafton, and um, Amen. God's doing great things up there. So I'm just excited for the opportunity to be able to come and minister. Amen. Thank you all for coming out and listening. Amen. I believe God's going to do some good stuff over the next couple of days. Amen. Amen. You believe that? I believe God's going to do some great things. Amen. Turn your Bible to the book of Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Isaiah, would you bring me my water, please? Now, I will say while you're turning there, I am an audience participation preacher. So if you like to participate with me, now let me give you a little secret. If you don't want me to preach very long, shout with me. Because you can see I'm getting fat and I wear out quick. If you all shout with me and get with me, I'll get preaching, sweat will get flying, I'll wear out fast. You all just sit back there. I can hit a pace and just go for hours. Amen? So the best thing you all could do for your own health and your own well-being is to just get in there with me while I'm preaching. Amen? There, go ahead. That's a good start. Let's practice. Let's everybody just shout hallelujah one time. Let me hear you. Amen. Praise God. That's it. If you keep that up, it won't take me long to get through this. Amen? Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 3. Are you there? It says, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion. Everybody say passion. By many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the season which the Father hath put in his own power. But look here. But you shall receive power. Everybody say power. After the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the utmost parts 
of the earth. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what we sense and feel already in this great church with this great ministry and pastor and leaders of this church. Father, I thank you for what they are doing in the kingdom. But Father, I pray that tonight that you would begin a refreshing and a stirring in us. Father, that we would understand that there is pain and that there is power. Father, I pray that today, Lord, that you would uh, uh, just allow your spirit to saturate this sanctuary that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done. Lord, I pray that you would hide me behind the cross of Calvary tonight. Let not my words be heard, but your words through me. Speak through me tonight. Holy Spirit, allow me to decrease that you would increase in this sanctuary. And Father, I thank you and I give you the glory and the praise for it in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. If you look here at this text in verse 3, he says, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion. I had you talk about passion. Now, when we read this passion, it's not talking about like a passion, like a romantic passion or having a passion for a loved one or a wife, but it's talking about his passion. It's talking about the suffering. It's talking about the pain that he went through. You remember a few years ago, the movie that came out, The Passion of the Christ. He's talking about his suffering, his pain. I want you to notice in verse 3, it talked about his pain, his passion, the suffering that he went through. And then down in verse 8, he said, and you shall uh, receive power. Everybody, I had you say power. So look in verse 3, he's talking about his pain and his suffering. And in verse 8, it's talking about power. Power. Now, I'm not trying to take you this out of context, but it is very simple that three comes before eight. Verse three comes before verse eight, and he's talking about pain in verse three, and he's talking about power in verse eight. And all I come to do tonight to tell you is that you've got to go through pain if you want to receive power. If, come on, if you're going to be able to receive the power, you've got to be willing to go through the suffering. You've got to be willing to go through the pain somebody say amen huh pain always comes before power in uh, second timothy chapter three starting at verse one paul was writing his second letter to his son timothy his spiritual son he says this know also that in the last days perilous times will come is there anybody here tonight that would agree that we are in perilous times Perilous times shall come. I declare perilous times are here. For men shall be lovers of them own selves. There'll be a selfie society. Uh, uh, stand beside the Grand Canyon and take a picture of yourself. Ain't nobody wants to see you. Take a picture of the Grand Canyon. Amen. Uh, men shall be lovers of themselves, covetous. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, in contempt, fierce, despisers of those that are good. We're, I mean, we are there. Does this look, this looks like you're watching the news. Traitors, heady, high minded, lovers of pleasure more than the lovers of God. But look here how it describes the last day. He said, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away does not say there will not be people acting godly it says they will have a form of godliness the only problem with having a form of godliness is you might dress godly and have your hair fixed godly and have a godly outfit on but many times it's just a form it's just a mask it's just a masquerade because God's not worried so much about a form of godliness he's looking for somebody that will really be godly he said in the last days that we would have a form of godliness, but look here, but denying the power thereof. He said from such turn away. Do you know what I believe? I believe that the reason that they did not have the power was because they did not have real godliness because real godliness hurts. I'm not talking about a form of godliness. We can all come to church and have a form of godliness. You can teach people how to have church. You can teach people how to say amen at the right time. You can teach people the Christian songs. You can teach people how to quote scripture.
culture and you can teach people how Christians dress and how Christians talk and how Christians ought to act but that will not produce power come on somebody because you can have an outward form of godliness but your heart is far from him can I tell you that if you want to see power being produced in the body of Christ today it will take godliness and real godliness hurts Real godliness, oh, come on somebody. It hurts when you have to put your flesh under subjection. Amen. It hurts when you have to tell your flesh, uh, if you're trying to crucify your flesh and maybe go on a fast, it hurts to tell your body, no, you're going to eat what I tell you to eat. I know you're crying out and I know you got a headache and I know you're getting the jitters and all this kind of stuff but you're going to eat what I tell you to eat because I'm going to put my flesh under subjection because of most of the problem that we have today is that we're not able to get our flesh under subjection. We spend 99% of the time in the flesh, 1% of the time in the spirit and we wonder why we don't see the power of God manifesting in our life and we wonder why we can't overcome temptation. The Bible said that when you live in the spirit and walk in the spirit uh, that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh I'm going somewhere you, I'm not going to stomp on your toes all night I'm going to just get it through in the beginning amen huh. putting your flesh under subjection hurts huh. fasting hurts living a separate life hurts huh. if you say living for God doesn't hurt you're not doing it right. Amen. If it doesn't hurt, you're not doing it right. If it's not at times hard, you're not doing it right. Because at times living for God, there's going to be things that you want to do that you don't do. There's going to be things that you enjoy doing. There's going to be things that you would like to do that you can find pleasure in doing, but you choose not to do them because you have decided that you are going to live godly and God is not pleased with it. Amen. When you're living godly, there's going to be particular lifestyles that you don't participate in. I know it might be socially acceptable. I know other people might like it. But and I know other people might say that it's okay and promote it. But whenever you're living for God, at times, it will be painful to live for him. There'll be some things that you would do that you don't feel like doing. Some of you are mowing grass tired out in the humidity wore out and you didn't feel like coming to church tonight in your flesh said just stay home watch television but you went ahead and crucified your flesh jumped in the shower made your way out to church tonight huh? and some of it it hurt I'll try not to help you fall asleep if you're tired huh? living for God Having true godliness, not a form of godliness, but actual godliness hurts. But I believe that in the last day that Paul was telling Timothy about, he said the reason that they would deny the power is because they did not go through the pain of godliness that produces power. They did not have real, true, actual godliness. They only had a form of godliness. Therefore, they denied the power thereof. Can I tell you that that represents a lot of people in the so-called body of Christ today uh, that they have a form of godliness but there's no power? Can I tell you that I believe that God still has some people and I believe some of them are in this church tonight uh, that are not satisfied with the status quo, uh, that are not satisfied the way things are, but they're looking for the power of God to produce the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the body once again. There's pain in living a godly life. But that pain produces power. I don't know if I could just stand on my little soapbox for a few moments this, this evening. I think we live in a society that has done its best to try to eliminate pain. I mean, we, try, we have eliminated pain to the point where we don't even like to roll up our windows anymore. Anybody remember having a car where you actually had to roll the window up and down? 
My first two or three chucks didn't even have an air conditioner in it. I thank God for the little triangle-shaped window. They don't even put a triangle-shaped window in trucks anymore. Uh, that was my air condition. I would get that triangle-shaped window. I would aim it right at me, and I would drive as fast as I could. Amen? But we have done our best to try to eliminate anything that would cause us an inconvenience. And I'm not saying it's all wrong. I like pushing the window with the push button. Amen? But I'm saying if you look at our society, we have done everything that we can to eliminate pain from our lives. I mean, even in, in our schools, everybody now gets a trophy. Amen? It's always somebody else's fault. There's no pain or consequences for our actions because it's somebody else's fault. You know your little kid's a hellion. And you know they terrorize the first grade. They terrorize the second grade. They terrorize the third grade. You bring them to church and they terrorize children's church. But yet when it comes down to it, it was the first grade teacher's fault. Then they had a second grade teacher that really didn't like them. Then I went to school with their third grade teacher and they had a problem with me and that's why they treated my kids so bad. How many say amen? We've always found a reason why it's somebody else's fault. Come on, somebody. It's somebody else's problem. We bring them to church. We know they're going to terrorize the children's church when we bring them in there. But yet there's no correction. There's, I don't know if I should preach this on the first night. I should have waited till later. Huh? But the we... When there's no correction, there's no discipline, there's no consequences for action because it's not really their fault. Are you with me today? It's the teacher's fault. You can be a lawbreaker. You can resist arrest. Amen. You can run, but somehow it's the officer's fault if you got in trouble. Are you with me today? Why? Because we're doing everything we can in our society to try to put everybody on the same playing field. It doesn't matter how hard you work or how little that you do. We're trying to put everybody, I'm not just talking about society. I'm going somewhere, stick with me. I'm not just beating on us tonight. You can be a lawbreaker, but it's somebody else's fault. And really the reason you are the way you are is because of your parents did something or you wasn't loved or because you had a situation or you had some kind of problem. That's really not your fault either. Your addiction's not your fault. I know you're 50 years old, but it's still somebody else's fault. You're in the problem you're in. Hello? We award those who don't work hard. We suppress those who do. I'm not real sure. I was reading an article and I preached about it a little bit in our church a week or so ago talking about how the suicide rate and mental illness is skyrocketing. A lot of it has to do with COVID. A lot of it has to do with the things going on in the world. The Bible talked about it. He said men's hearts would fail them, not for obesity, not because they ate too many cheeseburgers, not because of high cholesterol. Men's hearts would fail them for the things that they see coming on the earth. That's where we're at. People are so stressed out that literally their hearts are not able to take it. That's what the Bible was talking about. Men's hearts would fail them for the things that they would see coming on the earth we are living in that day and age but do you think that maybe just maybe that the reason that our young people are so mentally ill so to speak and that these, these numbers are skyrocketing by the hundreds of percent is it maybe because that we have spent so much time trying to uh, keep them from pain and keep them from struggle and keep them from going through anything and always fixing it for them and always He's fixing it for them and that person and, and it was always somebody else's fault that now that they have become adults uh, that they have not learned how to go through anything. They have not learned how to work through conflict uh, and when something does pop up in their lives that mommy or daddy can't fix they don't know how to deal with it. Is it possible? Are you with me today? I'm not sure but it works in every element of society. 
whenever we take our ability out to press through pain and press through situations in our lives and press through struggles and press through hardships, when we take out our ability to press through things, we raise a society that divorce rates skyrocket because people don't know how to work anything out. Well, I'm not happy. Who said you had to be happy? Woo. Please, all y'all quit jumping up. Makes me nervous. There's no place in the Bible that said we had to be happy all the time. Are you here with me today? No place it says we had to be happy. Matter of fact, he said put on the whole armor of God. Put on your helmet of salvation. Put, get your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Get your loins girded with the belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The sword of the spirit. The shield of faith. Why? So that because you have a battle, you're going to have a warfare. You're going to need all those things so you can stand against the schemes and the strategies of the devil. Huh? What would I need to have armor for if I wasn't going to fight? What would, what would I need armor for if I wasn't going to be in a battle? The whole reason that I have armor is because I'm going to be in a fight. I have to learn how to endure hardships as a good soldier. Anybody in here been through anything? Huh. It's, it not only works like that in our marriages, when people don't know how to go through conflict, the first conflict that they come into, they separate because I don't know how to deal with conflict. It works like that in the job force. The first little conflict that they have, find, I'm going to try to find me another job. It works like that in the church. I'll go to this church for a while as long as there's no conflict long as the preacher doesn't preach anything that would disturb me. Amen. And if, if anything disturbs me, I'm going to find someplace else. I'm going to jump out. I'm going to find another spot and I'll hang out there until that preacher disturbs me. This is good preaching. This is, this is, huh? This is the tough part. We got to get right tonight so that we can get ready the rest of the week. Amen? Huh? I believe with all of our efforts to eliminate pain from our society, we have also eliminated the power that is produced by going through something. You know you can tell the difference in the anointing on somebody that's been through something and somebody that has not been through something. You can tell when they pick up the microphone and they start to sing or they start to preach or, or they just start to minister in whatever way. You can tell the difference in somebody that has just, you know, some Johnny come lately that listened to a few uh, CDs or a few videos on YouTube and got a message or somebody that's been through something. Somebody that has been through some pain. Somebody that has been through some pressure. Somebody that's been rejected and talked about and lied on. Is anybody going to preach with me? Because when they come out God gives them something that was produced through their pain God gives them something that was pushed out of them while they were going through hell amen we spend so much time trying to be happy the truth is if you look around in the world there's not a whole lot spiritually speaking in the world to be happy about uh, we probably need to have a little bit more godly sorrow if we had a little bit more godly sorrow, maybe it would lead us to some more repentance. But we spend so much time trying to be happy that we spend very little time around the altar with godly sorrow calling for repentance and call because we want everything to be good and we want to feel good. And how many knows, has anybody in here ever been convicted before? Just wave at me. Conviction does not feel good. Have you ever come to church and it felt like the preacher just kept talking about you like tonight? And just when you thought he was going to start preaching about somebody else, he started preaching about you again. 
It would not hurt the body of Christ today to have a little bit more godly sorrow because the Bible says that conviction and godly sorrow, it produces the fear of God. It produces righteousness in us. Whenever we get to the place where we see ourselves where we're not happy, that causes us to be motivated to do something about it. My God, when we look around and we see the world going to hell in a handbasket and when we see our churches lying dormant and we see churches shutting down every day and pastors losing their minds and we see our young people, we look at our youth groups and we see our children, our grandchildren and they're hooked on drugs and they're as far away from church as you can get and yet we're trying to spend all of our time being happy. My God, I think we need to spend some time in the prayer closet grabbing a hold of the horns of the altar and say God shake them, shake them, stir them, start something in me create in me a clean heart and renew a right steady spirit in me I may say amen uh, in all of our efforts to eliminate pain we eliminate the strength that comes from going through the pain uh, that's why many of our churches lie powerless because we're not willing to go through the pain that produces the power. Hello? Let's let that just sink in a minute. Huh. As soon as we get going through anything somewhat painful, we jump ship. I thank God and I pay attention. In my own life, I pay attention to people that take a licking and keep on ticking. I might not always agree with them. I might not always say they're right. But I like to take my hat off and pay attention to people that know how to endure. I mean, people that grow up in ministry and maybe fall or get caught up in sin or whatever and stumble and you see and you found that it feels like they fell off the edge of the world and here you look five, six years later, you find out they got another church started and they're going and it's growing and the Holy Spirit's moving. Like I said, I'm not condoning maybe what happened, but I thank God for people that know how to endure stuff, that know how to go through stuff, that know how to go through pain, know how to go through, come on, humiliation, know how to be talked about and ridiculed know how to have people shun them and say I don't want to have neither, nothing to do with them but yet they continue to press on I admire that I want to have that in my own life I want people to be able to come back 20 years later and say I don't know I just know Pastor Mike kept on going he never quit yes he got knocked down but he didn't get knocked out he kept pressing on he kept going forward he never gave up why because there's power that is produced as we go through pain and suffering. Uh, pain produces power. Uh, the things that we go through in our lives that cause pain, they produce power in us. The people that have hurt you produce power in you. The people that talked about you on Facebook, it produced power in you. Don't give up while God is trying to use your pain to produce power. Do you know how many people, when they start to feel just a little bit of inconvenience, they jump ship, they quit, they backpedal, they stop, and they never allow the thing that they're going through to produce any power in them because they gave up before it came into fruition. They gave up before it was able to come. See, when you really start realizing that what you're going through is producing power in you, I know this is going to sound like a paradox, but you begin to embrace the pain because you know that this thing that I'm going through, God, is going to produce something great out of this. This circumstance that I'm going through, God is going to produce something great out of this. I think we can even look at it in our families, in our community, in our nation, and say the hell that we've been going through over the past few years, evidently, God is going to produce something great out of it. God chooses 
these th things that hurt, he chooses them to produce power in us. Huh. For just a minute, I want to talk to anybody in ministry. You can't be in ministry if you're afraid of getting hurt. You got to have skin like shoe leather. Huh. I'll just be honest. Huh. If you get offended easily, you might not want to be in ministry. I know everybody's talking about, I want to be in ministry. I want to be anointed. I want to be called. I want to be able to be a pastor. I want to be an evangelist. God's called me to be a prophet. God's called me to be an apostle to the nations, but yet they can't handle any offense. Matter of fact, I have found out that most people, whenever they begin to step in the calling of God in their lives, the first thing that happens to them is God allows offense. God allows offense to show up in their life. I mean, you can get people, I've seen it happen in our own ministry. You bring them up, you ordain them, you lay hands on them, you give them uh, the charge, and within a couple weeks, you might never ever see them again. You find out what happened, maybe somebody offended them. Somebody said something to them, somebody hurt them. Why? Because God allows those things to show up in our lives so that it can produce power in us. Come on, somebody. He wants to us endure the hardships. He wants to press forward towards the mark of the prize of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but somebody in here, what you've been going through, God sent me from the hills of West Virginia to tell you that it is producing power power in you. Don't give up. Don't quit. Don't stop. Don't change channels. Don't change direction. Don't go anywhere else because God is using what you're going through to produce power in your life. You with me? You want to see a move of the Spirit? You long for that? Be honest. Some people are just complacent. They're happy where it's at. They don't care if anybody ever, you know, the Holy Spirit ever moves. That gets you out of church earlier. Huh? Some people, the favorite thing about their church is when they get out. I asked somebody, I said, what's the best thing you like about your church? I like our church. We're out every Sunday by noon. I said, the favorite thing about your church is when you leave. I may say Amen. Preacher has us out of there every Sunday by noon. Well, good. Praise God. Huh? I was waiting for them to say, I love it when the Holy Spirit moves. I love it when the glory of God falls. I love it when people are slain out in the spirit and laying prostrate in his presence. I like when the glory gets so thick in the house of God that you're afraid to move because you don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. Is there anybody here to me? Come on, I, I, that's what I'm, I'm waiting for somebody that has a heart like that that says, you know what, I don't care if we stay here all night, all day. I just want to be in his presence. I want to be in his presence. How many, when's the last time you've been in a service where you could look in a building and you could see the fog of the Shekinah glory because he was being poured out in such away come on and people were being healed and set free and delivered and you here today listen that only comes when you and I are willing to endure affliction and endure pain and go through the suffering and go through the hardships and go through the things that be are inflicted upon us and we refuse to quit and we say I'll go through the fire but I'm going to refuse to burn I'll go through the waters, but I won't let them overflow me. Come on, somebody preach with me. I'll go through the floods, but I won't let them overtake me. I'm going to continue to press on. I'm going to continue to hold fast. I'm going to get a hold on this thing, and I'm not going to let go no matter what happens because the more pressure that I feel, the greater the anointing is going to be produced in my life. Do you know that when pressure is placed upon something, you'll always find out what's inside. If you place the pressure of your boot on a spider, you will find out what is inside of it. Right? Or if you're like me, if you call your wife to get the pressure of a spot, of her boot on a spider, I just don't like bugs. I don't like them sneaking up on me. It doesn't matter what it is. If you put pressure on something, you'll find out what's inside of it. Whenever God allows pressure to be placed upon you and I, he'll find out what's inside of us. 
Do you know a lot of people that have been going to church for years and you think they're some of the greatest saints, some of the most holy people, some of the most fiery people, power, powerful people in the kingdom? You put some pressure on them. And many times you'll find out that what's being produced out of them through the pressure will sometimes be anger, jealousy, bitterness, all different types of things. Whenever the pressure begins to get applied, listen, whenever the pressure begins to get applied in your life, what's being produced? What's being produced whenever the pressure is beginning to put on? When people are talking about you and they're forsaking you and they got masks and shutdowns and you can't go to school and the kids are home and you're not working or you lost your job and you get put under the pressure. Now, what's going on? The person that you prayed for and you were believing God that they were going to live and now you're at their funeral and the pressure has been applied. Now, what's going to happen? What's going to be produced out of you? Can I tell you that the pressure is what produces, it'll either produce the things that you don't want to come out of you or it will produce the anointing. You know, and and I'm sure you've all heard the illustrations before. If I have a big basket of olives, that does not mean that I have olive oil. Olive oil is the number one ingredient to the holy anointing ointment that God commanded Moses to anoint the tabernacle and everything. The priests, they all had this holy anointing ointment and the number one, the largest ingredient was olive oil. And there are many people that have a basket of raw olives and say, I have what I need to produce the anointing. And God's going to say, no, you just got the raw material in order for that to become part of the anointing. It has to go through the process. It has to go through pressure. It has to get crushed. It has to be pulverized. It has to be placed in the crucible. And the pressure has to be applied. And through the process, it will produce anointing. Ooh, somebody preach with me. Uh, I knew it was going to be quiet. I didn't know it was going to be this quiet. Hello? I'll get that later. Is there anybody... That has been feeling the pressure lately. About seven of you. Ten. Feeling the pressure. Listen, can I tell you that 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 pressure, God is using that to put you through the process. He's using that pressure to produce something that's been inside you for a long time. There's been anointings in you. There's been giftings in you. There's been ministries inside of you that are never going to ever come out of you if you don't allow the pressure to squeeze them out of you. You've had giftings that have been placed down inside you. That's what Paul was told Timothy. He said it was in your grandmother. It was in your mama. He said, and now that faith is inside of you. He said, I'm going to come lay hands on you and stir up the gift of God that's in you. How many say amen? He said, there's stuff that's been generational, that's been put down inside of you. But he said, I'm going to come stir that up because it'll never come out of you. And many times it's never produced. There are people that live on this planet and die. And the greatness that God has placed inside them is never produced because they run from pain. They run from pressure. They're not able to handle conflict. They're not able to go through the struggle. And every time God is about to produce something in them, they give up before it ever comes to fruition but God told me to tell somebody tonight to just go ahead and endure the affliction because God is going to use the pressure that's going on in your life to produce something inside of you hello I'm about done during my brief moments of workout I don't know about y'all, but I work out like in spurts. I get this thought, you know, I look at myself in the mirror and I'm thinking, what is wrong with you, son? And I think I'm going to go to the gym. So I go get a gym card and a membership. And then like a year later, I still have it. And 
and I'm paying $25 a month, and Mandy keeps saying, are you going to ever go to the gym, or are you, I'm not yet, but I feel like I'm going to get another thought here soon, I'm going to go. But in my brief encounters at the gym, the main thing that I realized is that it hurts. Does anybody here know what I'm talking about? Am I preaching to anybody? Have you ever went to the gym and the next morning your arms hurt so bad that you couldn't even scratch your nose? And you thought you were going to get you some cereal and you could not even stand to get a spoon and put cereal in your mouth? And when you decided to sit up out of the bed, your core hurt so bad that instead of sitting up, you just rolled out. Anybody? I know some of y'all been to the gym. I can see that right now. I have found out that working out hurts. Right? It hurts. Especially when you don't have a lot of power or that your power is diminished from lack of working out. So I started working out with a guy at church. He has arms about like that. This guy, I'm not kidding you. He's like a linebacker. If you give him a hug, it's like hugging this wooden podium. Huh? And we started working out and he started telling me, I I was listening to something that he was saying, and he would say, oh, that's good, I'm starting to feel it. What do you mean you're starting to feel it? It's starting to hurt. He was looking for it to hurt. And I was thinking, I'm trying to keep it from hurting. And he lifts until it hurts. And what happens is, He lifts to a certain part where his muscles get strong and what used to hurt him doesn't hurt him anymore. And so you know what he does when it stops hurting? He puts on more weight because when when it's starting to hurt him, he knows that he's getting stronger. He knows that his capacity and his ability to do more is growing because it hurts. If it's not hurting, you know the old cliche, no pain, uh, don't you hate that? Huh? No pain, no gain. You know how it goes. And so he's working until he starts to feel the pain and he starts to feel the burn. And when he leaves, I'm hobbling myself out to the truck and he's like, man, that felt good. I feel the burn. He's looking at it completely different than I am. He's looking for the pain because the pain means that he's getting stronger. The pain that's being produced means that as long as I'm feeling pain, that means that I have the potential to increase. I have the potential to get stronger. I have the potential to lift more. I have the potential to push more. I have the potential to have more endurance because I feel the pain. And the more I feel the pain, the more that I know that there's a work that's being done. Can I tell you that you and I should embrace the pain because the pain that you're going through, what you used to not be able to handle you'll be handling huh? the pressure that you used to not be able to take you'll be able to take it I get thinking about that even when it comes to ministry when I first started preaching I think my paycheck was like $25 a week and that was if it came in the offering A lot of times it wasn't even in there to get that. And I got thinking, if God would have ever just took me when I was 18 years old and said, here, and I mean, I'm I'm not saying, I'm not bragging or saying anything huge. I'm just saying we just spent $40,000 on payment a couple months ago. 
And I, if, if God were just took me when I was 18 years old and put me to a place where I had to think about coming up with $40,000 for payment, and I wasn't even sure if I could get $25 to get my paycheck. How many say amen? I would have had a nervous breakdown. I would have had a nervous breakdown. I would not have been able to handle that kind of pressure. How would, how would I, when I was 18 years old, standing in a little storefront, how would I be able to look out there at a, a few people and say, we got to have $40,000 today to put pavement down? I would have not been able to take it. How would I have been able to look up at the projector and say, we need $800 for a bulb? Let me say Amen. How would I be able to look at him and say, hey, we need $1,500 this week so that we can pay for the television time or whatever it might be? Or how would I be able to say, we need $10,000 this week for the mission trip so that we can go to Haiti and so that we can feed the hungry? Are you here with me today? You know what God does? He takes you from step to step. He takes you from faith to faith and from glory to glory. He says, yeah, you worry about getting this $25 today, but I'm going to produce more and the more it hurts I'm going to increase your capacity and I'm going to take you up a little bit farther and I'm going to make you a little bit stronger and yes it's going to hurt and yes there's going to be tears and I'm going to have some people walk out on you because you got to be able to learn how to handle it when a few people walk out on you because what you're going to do whenever there's a COVID virus and you look out at your congregation and 75% of the people are gone you got to have faith then so you're able to have faith now you got to go through the pain then so you're able to produce the power now what God's bringing us through right now I promise you he's making us stronger the pain is proof that you're getting stronger if you don't feel the pain you're not pushing up enough weight yet If you're not feeling in the pain, you need to increase your pressure. Once you start feeling the pain, you know that strength is being produced because pain comes before power. Pain comes before power. And you will never have power if you're not willing to endure the pain. That wasn't real hard, was it? That was pretty simple. But it's a lot harder to live it. It's a lot harder to live it. But can I tell you that if you and I want to embrace the power of God, we are going to have to also embrace the passion and the pain that comes from living a godly life, that comes from repentance, that comes from being, we got to quit spending all of our time just trying to be happy and trying to feel good. I like to feel good just the, the, like everybody else does. But feeling good doesn't produce any power. If you go to the gym and you don't feel anything, you should have just stayed home and watched the Olympics. You wasted your time. If you went to the gym and you didn't feel any pain and you left the gym and you felt just as good after you left as you came in, you either are really in shape and need to increase or you didn't do enough. Woo, somebody ought to shout with me. That's the same way it is in the body of Christ. It ought to hurt us every once in a while. You ought to get to the point in your life where you need him. Come on, somebody. If you come to church and you don't need him, it's because you haven't been under enough pressure. And you can tell the difference when you're preaching to a group of people that really need something. Some people come to church because it's Sunday. Other people come to church because they need something. Because because they're going through hell because they're going through fiery trials because they need him and when you have services like that and you have people like that you'll see a move of God because pain produces power amen when's the last time that you really came to God because you needed something something was hurting you your heart was broke. 
your mind was hurt. Not just because the preacher said, does anybody need anything? And then had to stand up for 15 minutes and try to beg you to think you, you need something. Are you sure you don't need something? You need saved? You need healed? You need delivered? You need anything? Then will we even go to, do you know anybody else that needs it? We just want to pray for you. Do you know anybody else that needs prayer? Huh? But you know what the truth is? If you and I are not experienced in the pain, it's because we have not positioned ourselves in a place to get stronger so that we can feel the power. You look throughout our nation's history, the greatest move of God's came whenever there was national problems and wars and depressions and, and all kinds of things like that. It produced something in a nation. Why? Because they needed something. My God, don't let, ever let me get comfortable enough where I feel like I don't need him. I want to every day feel like I need him to take my next breath, that I need him just to be able to focus, that I need him just to be able to put a sentence together, that I need him just to give me strength in my ankles and strength in my feet, that I need him with everything. Don't look here at one moment and think that you're looking at a preacher that has it all together because I need him for everything that I do because everything, come on, in everything that we do, we need to know that with Without him, we'll never succeed. Without him, it will never be able to produce anything in our lives. Amen. Look at somebody beside you and tell them, you got to have the pain before you can produce the power. And let me tell you this, and I'm closing. You can come back up. You can come back up, Zayn. You guys, uh, will it come back up if you want? If you want to see the power of God, it's only going to come as you and I press through the pain, hold on through the pain, hold on through the struggle, hold on through the, the passion, the suffering. Huh. I don't know who I'm even preaching to tonight. I have been delivered, you'll find out, from preaching to everybody. I used to, when I first started preaching, I wanted to preach to everybody. I wanted to have a message that would reach anybody. I was delivered from that. Now I just want to preach to somebody. If tonight wasn't your message, come back tomorrow. Maybe it will be. But if you're in here tonight and you say, Pastor Mike, I have been going through pain I've been going through some stuff. I've been questioning some stuff. Man, it's been hurting. There's some stuff down in my life that I'm even embarrassed to talk about. I've been questioning God in some areas, and I feel like just thinking about it, just thinking about it, I'm, I'm, I'm damaging my faith. But these are real feelings that I have. It hurts. I've had some struggles that have hurt. I've got some questions. There's some things going on in my life that are not lining up with my faith. I've been believing God. I've been doing what the Bible says. I've been paying my tithes. I've been giving. I've been sowing. I've been giving alms. I've been doing offerings. I've been doing everything. And this, what's going on now in my life is not lining up with my faith. I don't know. If you ever go through something in your life, that is completely diametrically opposed to what you believe, man, it hurts. When you're like, I believe it, and this is what his word says. His word says that I, he's my healer. I know he took the stripes on his back. I know the biblical principles of healing. I know that he took away and redeemed me from the curse of the law, and the curse of the law had all the sicknesses in it. I know that by his stripes I was healed, but here I am sick. I've been praying I've been seeking and I've been asking and I've been begging and it hurts I've been trying to have peace because my Bible says that if I'll keep my mind on him that he'll keep me in perfect peace but yet I'm having anxiety yet I'm so anxious I'm so anxious I can't hardly rest and I jump every time I hear a noise. I'm so depressed. 
I don't even know why I'm depressed. I don't have a reason to be depressed. I don't know why I feel the way that I do. I don't know why I'm going. I don't know why I'm so afraid. I don't know why I'm so afraid. I can't even walk into the house and nobody's there. I can't even take a shower and close the door behind me. I don't know what it is, but it's not lining up with my faith. Whenever things don't line up with your faith, it hurts. But can I tell you that God is going to use what you're going through to produce power in your life if you'll let him do it. If you'll let him do it, he'll take what you're going through. He'll take the pain. He'll take the struggle. He'll take the process. Right now, you can say, I've just got, I'm just a basket of olives. But God is going to allow what you're going through to produce the pressure of it to produce and bring something out of you that's been inside you. I don't know who that's for tonight, but I want to lay hands on you and pray for you. Stand up to your feet if you would. Is there anybody here tonight and you say, Pastor Mike, I've already talked to your pastor. He said it's okay. Is there anybody tonight, and I'm not going to push you. You know whether or not you need something from God. You know if you have been being hurt. You know that it hurts. If you're in here today and you say, Pastor Mike, I have been going through some pain. And I'm believing God to turn this pain into power. I'm going to hold on. I'm going to hold on. Through the pain, I'm going to hold on through the struggle. I'm going to hold on until the power comes in. And I just need somebody to agree with me. Pastor Mike, it's hard. I've been struggling. I've been struggling with living a godly life. Every time I try to make a step forward, I keep slipping. I keep falling. I keep telling God I'll never do it again. And I keep falling back in the same trap. I keep making promises that I'm not keeping. It's hurting to try to live a godly life. I have friends that are pulling me. I got relationships that are pulling me the, right, the wrong way. I need some strength to be able to endure through this pain so that I can receive power. If that's you, I want you to get out of your seat. Would you come here and meet me? I'm going to have Mandy and I don't know if the pastor or any ushers that want to help me. Just, just come up and agree. I just want to agree with you. Is there anybody here tonight and you say, you know what, Pastor Mike? I'm not where I need to be with Jesus. I'm not saved. What's salvation? It's easy. God placed a judgment on sin. We've all sinned. We all deserve his judgment. But he loves us so much. That he sent his son Jesus and he died so I wouldn't have to. The stripes placed upon his back, the beating, the punishment that he took was God's punishment for sin being placed upon Jesus. He was judged so I don't have to be. He was punished so I don't have to be. All sin has to be paid for. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. There's two ways you're going to pay for your sin. You're either going to accept what Jesus did and allow him to pay for it or someday you have to stand before God and you have to pay for it on your own and listen none of us are righteous enough to pay for it on our own we'll have to pay for it with eternal separation from God hell is there anybody here today and you say pastor Mike I believe what you said I've never been saved before or I was saved but you know I'm not in the place where I need to be with God and I need to renew my commitment with him today I want to I, before I leave this church service tonight I want to make sure I got everything right between me and God. Is there anybody here tonight? You can know that. Just wave at me. Say, Pastor Mike, I need you to pray for me. Is there anybody? You're all saved? Good. Listen, here's your homework. Go out tonight and tomorrow and bring some unsaved people to church with you tomorrow. How many say amen? Wouldn't it be good if I gave an altar call tomorrow and all the people you brought with you got saved and come up here? Amen? You only got a couple nights to do it. If you're saved, you need to bring some people that's not saved with you. We'll get them saved before they leave. Amen? I promise you, if you bring them, I'll preach to them and I'll give them an altar call and the Holy Spirit will be here and they'll, they'll get saved. I believe that with all my heart. How many say amen? Amen. Give your pastor a big hand clap. God bless you. Thank you for allowing us to be able to come. We'll see you tomorrow night. Amen? Glory to God. Amen. Uh, I've been telling you for weeks that uh, we were going to have a good time. Great preacher. Love Pastor Evangelist Mike and his family. 
and I know you were touched tonight. I didn't say anything about it prior to the service, but uh, we haven't, since COVID got ramped up, we haven't done traditional offerings. But I want you to make sure that you invest in this ministry. If you're not prepared tonight, you've got tomorrow night and Sunday morning. Here in the sanctuary, there are boxes back there to each side of the sound room. And you can use an envelope there in the pew. And anything you put in there, if it's a check, you can just write on the check. Or you can, on the uh, envelope itself, designate. If you're using cash, that's fine. You can bypass the church. This right hand of the church doesn't want doesn't have to know what your left hand does. We do everything with our left hand, right? Don't you? You don't? All right, well, I do. <laughs> and if you want to give directly to them, you're all, you know you always have my blessing to do that, okay? But I just want to encourage you to come prepared. Yes, bring somebody tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. Just more of this great stuff. You got a little bit of a clinic tonight in really starting... A revival. Now, 75 years ago, that beginning was intended to go for a week, two, or ten. But the idea that there has to be a breaking among the people of God is always first night business. It really is. And I knew right where he was going. I said, yeah, this, this is it. But throughout that, there was a lot of encouragement for us, wasn't there? A lot of hope. I thought of some situations that I know, and I was thinking, oh, I wish I didn't. I'm just now seeing who's here. And I really wish that, um, I know a couple of situations I wish had been here tonight. Uh, we have audio of this, I'm certain. Was it on Facebook tonight? Did we? No, okay. But we have audio of it. Do we have, would video be available? Yep, so you can, you can get the, the video from this. Stand with me tonight and let's, um, let's thank the Lord, amen? I said to the Lord tonight, I'm so glad that I can worship you because there's nobody else I could worship. And I spend a lot of my time, as I've told you, for me, like just the name of Jesus. I love how we did that stuff there. And uh, Pastor Mike started with that, that name of Jesus, because I spend a lot of time there every morning, just the importance of that name. And without him, we have no one to worship. Anything we worship would be false, dead, lifeless. But we have him. Amen. May the Lord bless you tonight with strength. And may that strength come from a pain that you can pass through. You can endure. May that strength come from a pain that's not too much. Uncomfortable, but not overwhelming. May God give you the confidence that he's allowing it. He's holding the weights and deciding how much you're going to have to lift. And then when it gets to be too much, he's going to give you that confidence that in that pain, you're finding power. May his power be manifested in you so that others benefit, so that God gets glory and so that you have treasure in heaven now and until Jesus Christ comes. Amen. Wasn't it good to see those young guys sitting right up here? Those two uh, younger ones. Uh, yeah, bring somebody in tomorrow night and make them sit right here. 7 o'clock, I'll see you in the house of the Lord. Hug somebody or shake a hand or say hi from a distance. We love you. We'll see you tomorrow night.